Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series, Poems, Prayers, and Promises, a look at a variety of psalms. The psalms are the prayers of God's people, encouraging and teaching us how to pray in our day. We hope this helps you understand and apply God's word in your life today. It was a prayer, but it's unique in that it's a prayer for a specific person. It's a prayer for the king. So in your Bible, there might be a heading that says something like of Solomon or for Solomon or concerning Solomon. Usually the superscript gives us some, some sort of clue about who wrote the psalm, but sometimes it just tells us who the psalm was for. So we're not sure if Solomon wrote this psalm or uh, if it was written for him or about him. What we know is that the psalm was written as a prayer for Solomon as he ascended the throne. It's what was called a, a coronation hymn, and it was a common practice in the ancient Near East. Um, very often, as kings ascended the throne, they would pray to the god or gods of their people for, uh, for health and prosperity. And generally speaking, the people would join in because how things went with the king is how they went with the rest of the country. So everyone wants the king to do well because they want to do well. So we're going to turn now to Psalm 72 and, and to read the word of the Lord. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. Maybe he, may he be like a falling rain on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all the nations serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence for precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. May grain abound throughout the land on the tops of the hills. May it sway. May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all nations will be blessed through him and they will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. This concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse. Solomon's uh, story is a very interesting one. The great actor and movie director Orson Welles was fond of saying the only difference between a happy ending and a sad ending was where you stop the story. We've seen lots of examples of, of that in our own times. Uh, I won't pick on contemporaries, so I'll go back a little bit. You may have heard of Marilyn Monroe. She started strong and, and ended badly. Elvis comes to mind in, in politics. Richard Nixon's uh, dramatic fall from power stands out. I think an even closer parallel to Solomon might be another king who, who started well and ended badly, King Adam. We don't normally think of Adam as a king, but he was a king. He was given dominion and told to rule by no less than God himself, but instead he betrayed God and, and turned against him. That's the story of Solomon. Solomon ascended the throne when he was 20 years old. On the eve of his coronation, he makes this beautiful, sweet, humble prayer. He says, Lord, give me wisdom to govern rightly. I'm a little child. 
I need your inspiration, your guidance. He asks for a discerning heart. And God answers Solomon's prayer. He, he gives Solomon great wisdom and, and discernment. We, we read in 1 Kings 10.24, the whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. The entire 10th chapter is about the magnificence and the wealth and the splendor of Solomon. But then in the first verse of the very next chapter, 1 Kings 11.1, 1, it says this, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. So Solomon does exactly what the Lord tells Israel not to do, and he marries foreign wives. In verse 3, it says he takes foreign wives. It says he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And look at, no matter how much you love your mother-in-law, if you had a 1,000 of them, you're going to find a few that are, that are going to be a pain. And then in verse 4, it says, As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord. Uh, his God is the heart of David, his father had been. David, now, now, David certainly had his flaws, but he was a man after God's own heart. Solomon's wives turned his heart away from God. And then the text says in verse 5, He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. And Moloch was particularly detestable because Moloch was a god who demanded child sacrifice. In verse 7, it, it tells us Solomon built high places to, to worship these foreign gods. In fact, verse 8 says he built uh, places of worship for all his foreign wives where they could uh, pray and, and sacrifice to their gods. And the story goes on that the Lord became angry with Solomon and he raised up enemies, both foreign and domestic. And so Solomon, whose name means peace, would know no peace. So Solomon's a train wreck, but he's a train wreck in a, in, in, a, in a super slow motion way. He starts out strong, and it takes years, but he ends badly. So given what a, a mess Solomon made of his life and his reign, maybe you're wondering why this sermon is called A Prayer for the Good King. Well, we'll get there. I'll get to that, I promise. This walk through the Psalms has been, a, uh, been an interesting one. If if you've missed any of them, you should really try to go back and listen to them. They're, they're, they've been really delightful. I, I won't try to hit the high bar Bobby set for comedy a couple of weeks ago um, when he talked about Psalm 34, because you know I'm not very funny. Um, last week, Simeon gave us a, you know, kind of a, a new standard of, of passion and, and eloquence when he talked about Psalm 46, um, and that was just terrific. Um, and I'm totally unqualified to meet the intellectual bar that Phil Moore um, raised with uh, Psalm, his teaching on Psalm 102 uh, three Sundays ago. However, I did run across this really interesting reference to another coronation hymn from the ancient Near East as I was preparing for this sermon. And that's the coronation hymn of uh, uh, Ashurbanipal. I got that out. One of the last of the Assyrian kings who ruled in the 7th century B.C., uh, Ashurbanipal reigned over pretty much the entire known world, from Cyprus in the west to Iran in the east. Uh, his father, Asarhaddon, uh, had even conquered Egypt, and so for a while Ashurbanipal ruled over Egypt. His, his capital was Nineveh, the world's largest city back then, and it was his grandfather, um, uh, Sunakrib, uh, Ashurbanipal's grandfather, who Jonah visited about a century uh, earlier on his mission to Nineveh. Uh, Ashurbanipal, Ashurbanipal's uh, coronation hymn was, was likely cited by a priest as he ascended the throne, and, and it shares a lot of the, the same themes with other Near East coronation hymns, including our psalm today, Psalm 72. For, a, for, for example, the Ashurbanipal hymn calls for the king to have long life and long reign, and Enki, the the Mesopotamian god of wisdom and magic should provide understanding and eloquence, that his kingdom might expand, that the people would be prosperous, and that grain and oil would be plentiful and, and uh, inexpensive, and that Enlil, the god of agriculture, would pr provide rain for crops. The point is that, that these themes were all present in a genre of sort of coronation hymns common in the ancient Middle East, including Psalm 72. 
And while there are lots of similarities to Psalm 72, there are also a couple of really important differences, and we'll get to that later. So Psalm 72 is a coronation prayer for the king, written for or by Solomon. And we know this partly because of the superscription, where it says it's of Solomon, but we also know because of uh, certain Solomonic themes that come through. Verses 3 and 7 allude to peace for the people, shalom, peace, Uh, Especially in Solomon's early years, uh, peace characterized Solomon's reign. 1 Kings 2 and 1 Kings 4 tells us Solomon ascended the throne with peace on all sides. Even the name Solomon, which is uh, Hebrew for Shelomo, maybe maybe you can hear the word Shalom in his name, the name means peace. He he probably wasn't originally born Solomon. In 2 Samuel 12.25, we're told his name was Jedidiah at birth. But at some point, David and Bathsheba started calling him Solomon, maybe because David had won a victory over the Ammonites, and for a time, uh, Israel enjoyed peace. Then verse 8 talks about dominion from sea to sea, and Solomon inherited a kingdom that ran from the Mediterranean to the west, to the Red Sea in the east, and from the land of the Philistines in the north down to the border of Egypt. Verses 9 through 10 mentions tribes bowing down. Uh, And I especially like this verse about his enemies licking the dust. Maybe you've heard the song by the band Queen, and another one bites the dust. Not not sure if the songwriter was aware of it, but we get that saying, bites the dust from from the Bible. And and verse 10, that the the kings of distant shores might pay tribute to him and and present him gifts. Verse 10 also mentions... Uh, gifts from Sheba in 1 Kings 10, we read that the queen of Sheba brought gold. Uh, The point I'm trying to make is just that uh, there are Solomonic themes all through this psalm. In addition to the Solomonic themes, the psalm tells us what the people's hope for, uh, hope for the new king was as they, as he ascended the throne. He was, he was to rule with God's justice and righteousness. And again, in 1 Kings 10, we we see the queen of Sheba visiting Solomon and reminding him that his purpose as monarch is to execute justice and righteousness. There's also an emphasis in Psalm 72 on godly character. The new king is supposed to be God's representative and rule with the righteousness and justice of God. Verses 1 and 2 say, Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones, with justice. Deuteronomy 17 tells us that the human king must study the scriptures and fear God if he's to rule rightly. And this is important. He's to see the people not as his people, but as God's people. And the king is to understand he's not better than his fellow Israelites, and that, and that he should live under the same rules as the people. And let me just say that that's amazing, because, because it's a miracle, that this idea that that, that, that rulers should be governed by the same rules as the governed. That's a miracle because it absolutely goes against human nature. Most of the civilizations of, of this world have had, had one set of rules for the elites and, and another for regular people. That's the natural default, but the Bible says that's wrong. The people belong to God, not the government. It's a, it's a radical way of thinking, and it comes right from the Bible. So Psalm 72 says the king must submit to God's authority as expressed in God's scriptures. He must understand that God is the true king and that whatever form of government, God's sovereignty and and ultimate reign are constant. So whether you're citizens of the U.S. or the U.K. or the U.A.E., God is king. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, God is king. Whether you're privileged or poor, God is king. And that takes us to another, psalm of psalm, uh, another theme of Psalm 72. The king must express godly character by enforcing equal justice under the law, regardless of wealth or status. In verse 4, it says he's to defend the afflicted and save the children of the needy. He's to crush the oppressor. In verses 12, 13, and 14, he's to deliver the needy, take pity on the weak, save the needy from death, and, and rescue those oppressed and victimized. Verse 14, it says he's to value life because, because blood is precious in, their sight, in his sight. And so he's to treat every person with value and dignity. And, and that's a miracle too, this, in, this insistence on every person being of 
equal worth and to be treated with respect. Even criminals who are accused of doing terrible things are presumed innocent until proven guilty. We think of that as a modern idea because it's not how human beings throughout history have acted, <laughs> not even in the West. But it's not a modern idea. It comes from the Bible, and the Bible's assertion that each person is a, an image bearer of God. And make no mistake, these, these values, the idea that everyone must live by the same rules, governors and governed alike, and, and that every person is due dignity and, and equality, these values are fragile and, and can disappear if we walk away from biblical teaching. And in verse 7 it says, he's to care for the flourishing of the righteous and promote their prosperity. So, so far we've talked about Psalm 72 as a coronation prayer. We've talked about Solomonic themes, the godly character the king is supposed to display, and the, and the rule of uh, how the, the king is supposed to rule as God's representative. But let's consider Psalm 72's meaning within its literary context for a second. And to do that, um, we need to take a step back and consider the whole outline of the Psalter. I've tried to show what this means on this slide. Uh, Psalm, Psalms is not a, a jumble of prayers and hymns written by many different people in many different circumstances over a couple thousand years. I mean, it is that, but it's more than that. You'll notice in your Bible, perhaps, that uh, every once in a while while you're going through the Psalms, there's these division markers. They, their divisions are generally titles as books one through five. And these aren't modern editions. They're, they're part of the original organization by the inspired editor of the Psalms. The books are organized with some internal unity. Book one is mostly Psalms by David. Book two is mostly Davidic Psalms as well, but uh, they use the name Elohim for, for God rather than Yahweh. Book three is typically darker uh, and has fewer Psalms by David and, and more by a man named Asaph. Book four begins with a, a Psalm by Moses, and he's pretty much the most prominent character in the book. Book five is jubilant and ends with celebration. Uh, there's also a prelude to the book of Psalms, Psalms 1 and 2. Psalm 1 is called a, a Torah psalm because it's about uh, instruction, and Psalm 2 is called a royal or a kingship psalm because it introduces this idea of king. It's also called a messianic psalm because it foretells the coming king of kings. Uh, you, you may remember verse 6, I've installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. And so these two psalms, Psalm 1 and 2, provide sort of the main keynotes, thematic keynotes of the Psalter. And as we've seen, Psalm 2, 72, the one we're in today, develops the theme of kingship that was introduced in Psalm 2. It's also special because it closes out Book 2, and it's called a seam psalm. Seam psalms come at the end of each of the five books in the Psalter and are called seam psalms because they join two different books or movements of the Psalter together. To, to see what makes seam psalms different, we're going to look at the, uh, the verses following Psalm 72, which are actually found in Psalm 72. And before you ask what in the world I'm talking about, let me clarify and say the last three verses that end Psalm 72 are not really technically part of the psalm. The coronation hymn ends with Psalm, I'm sorry, ends with verse 17. The three verses after verse 17 were apparently written by the inspired editor who organized the Psalter. The seam psalms all tend to strike royal chords with messianic themes, and each seam psalm actually closes with a doxology, that is a call to praise God. Praise be to the Lord, praise the Lord. It's helpful to look at the five doxologies in order, so, so we're going to check those out. The first one is in Psalm 41, 13. This is at the end of book one. So in Psalm 41, the, the seam psalm that closes book one, we read this. Psalm 41, 13. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. What about book two? Book two ends with our psalm today, Psalm 72, and it closes with this. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to the, his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And let's not forget verse 20. This concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse. Davidic themes mostly tie these first two movements of the Psalter together, so it makes sense to, to say the prayers of David, son of Jesse, are, are now ended, though, though David 
wrote a number of psalms that will appear in other books. Okay, then what about book three? Book three ends with Psalm 89, and in the last verse, verse 52, we read, praise be to the Lord forever, amen and amen. And then, on, and then it's on to book four. It ends with Psalm 106, where we read, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, let all the people say, amen, praise the Lord. And then finally, book five ends with Psalm 145, verse 21, my mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. But wait, there's more. There's five more psalms, and each one is kind of a, an extended doxology calling on the people to praise God. They're like a, a culmination of praise hymns, opening and closing with praise the Lord over and over in each of the last five psalms. They open with hallelujah, they close with hallelujah. There are hallelujahs throughout. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. In the, in the 59 verses in Psalms 146 through 150, we're told 38 times, praise the Lord. And so in light of the doxologies found in the same psalms and, and the 38 hallelujahs in the closing five psalms, we conclude that the main point of the book of Psalms is to call on God's people to praise him. The purpose of the whole Psalter first and foremost, is to encourage God's people to, to pray, to worship, and to praise the Lord. So when it comes to praising the Lord, as our coronation psalm insists, how does Solomon measure up? Not well, not well. He's disobeyed God by marrying women of other faiths. He's followed the gods of his wives. He's built places of worship to those gods, and including to Molech and Kamash, gods who required human sacrifice. He, he's not ruled in righteousness. He's, he's not displayed godly character. He's not rescued the oppressed. He's not defended the weak. He's not cared for the children of the needy. In short, if Psalm 72 is only about Solomon, it might as well be the same kind of vain boasting we see in the coronation hymn of Ashurbanipal. It, it might as well be cast aside. So who is Psalm 72 really about? I'm sure the human writer intended it as a prayer for Solomon. But what did the Holy Spirit who inspired this and every other psalm intend? Verse 11 says, May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. That's not Solomon, not even close. <laughs> Verse 13 says, He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. When it comes to death, who's needy? All of us, right? Everyone. What can Solomon do about death? Not much. Verse 17 says, all nations will be blessed through him and they will call him blessed. Again, not even close. Psalm 72 is called a, a royal psalm because of its Davidic themes, and fair enough. And you can forgive those who don't see Christ in this psalm because Christ and Solomon could not be more different. One was born to privilege and wealth. The other was born in a feeding trough, the poorest of the poor. One was the master over his nation's affairs. The other grew up under a ruthless superpower, the, the Romans, who would sometimes crucify hundreds of, of his countrymen by the roadside just to send a message to prospective rebels. One was surrounded by the brightest and, and most learned advisors in the known world. The other collected as his supporters uh, an unlikely assortment of zealots and tax collectors and uneducated fishermen. One ruled from a palace where kings and queens paid tribute. The other toured Israel as a penniless, homeless, sometimes wildly unpopular preacher. One reigned as king for 40 years, amassed more wealth than, the, than anyone in the world had ever seen at that time, and took to himself 700 wives and 300 concubines. The other preached for three years, until he was betrayed by his own people and handed over to be tortured and murdered. One was a king remembered for a few good deeds and a great many failures. The other changed the world. And all nations have been blessed through him. You know who Psalm 72 is really about because his ragged bunch of followers swore even as it cost each of them their lives, they swore to the end that they had personally seen Jesus risen bodily 
from the grave. They swore that he had ascended to the throne, uh, the throne of the cosmos, the entire universe. They, they traveled the world telling anyone who would listen that the promised Messiah, the Son of God, had come and that Jesus was indeed the eternal king promised in the Bible. These former fishermen and tax collectors and zealot sinners, each and every one, were transformed by their time with Jesus. After the resurrection, they lived such amazing lives of courage and grace and truth that couldn't be ignored. And their words turned the world upside down. In fact, within a, within a few hundred years, the empire that had executed Jesus confessed him as Lord and King. These are facts. They're, they're not in dispute by any reputable historian. Plenty of people, you know, claim the resurrection never happened or the miracles in the Bible are, are exaggerated or the virgin birth is and was scientifically impossible. But the actual reality of Christ's life, his teachings, his death, they're not in dispute. Christ's teachings are recorded in the Bible for, for anyone to see. And the results of those teachings and the world they created are the world we live in today. It's the most amazing fact in all of history. A man as opposite Solomon as it is possible to be, the impoverished preacher who never held political office, never entered religious orders, never served in the military, never schooled in the way we think about education, never wrote a book, never led an army, never had an ounce of earthly power as we understand power. The man who was butchered as a blasphemer at age 33, he's the hinge that all of history swings on. He's the most important human ever born. And for the last 2,000 years, billions of people have called him Lord. Only Jesus embodies the godly character described in Psalm 72, like defending the poor, crushing the oppressors, having compassion on the weak, valuing human life, redeeming people from violence. Only Jesus saves the lives of the needy, you and me. Only Jesus values all of this and does all of this. Of course, the Christ, for, for the Christian, the, the ultimate fulfillment of this psalm, psalm is going to come in the second advent when he returns to mete out justice and right all wrongs, crush the ultimate oppressor, the adversary. He comes to reign universally and eternally and to reconcile all things to himself. Verse seven, verse, I'm sorry, verse 5 says, May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. That can't be about Solomon. He's dead. <laughs> this is about Messiah's enduring reign. Verse 8 says, May he rule from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Solomon had a pretty good-sized nation, but it hardly reached the ends of the earth. That's why in Zechariah 9, the prophet Zechariah applies verse 8 directly to Messiah in uh, Zechariah 9.10, it says this, he will, he will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. He quotes uh, Psalm 72.17 verbatim. Now, given all of that, the fact of his teachings, his sinless life, his infinite love, the fact of his brutal sacrifice and the testimony of many reliable witnesses, and the improbability but absolute fact of his rise to being the most important human ever in history to walk the planet. Given all that, who do you think is more unreasonable? Those who deny the possibility of his re resurrection or those who witnessed it? Before you discount Christ because of the virgin birth or the miracles or the resurrection, consider Christ the person, Christ the divine and eternal king that Psalm 72 is talking about. That's why this sermon is entitled The Good King, because that's who King Jesus is. So how do we weak and frail humans apply Psalm 72? First, do you recognize that Jesus is king of the cosmos and of your life? It's not about politics, it's about God. It's always been about God. The Bible tells us Jesus walked around 33 years on this planet as though he owned the place. He does. <laughs> He's the maker and ruler of the universe, of you and of me. Do you trust and worship and obey the one who made you? Second, 
Psalm 72 tells us we should value godly character in our king. But the scriptures over and over tell us we're also supposed to value godly character in ourselves. Half the laws in the Pentateuch are about the gritty details of caring for others. Half the commandments of the Decalogue are about loving one's neighbor. Just as Israel's king was to embody God's values in, in order to pr promote human flourishing, so we all, as God's royal image bearers, should also embody God's values. Third, Psalm 72 is a prayer for the king. The, speak, the people at the time spoke it as a prayer for Solomon and, and the Davidic kings to follow. Paul tells us we are to pray for those in authority. 1 Timothy uh, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Paul says this, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving may be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And I think what Paul is saying here, at a bare minimum anyway, is that we should pray for the salvation of our leaders and that they'll come to a knowledge of the truth. Because the gospel is what changes hearts. You can't expect non-believers to behave as believers. I mean, I guess you can, but you'll only ever be disappointed. So we're to pray for our representatives, our president, our governor, our municipal officials, Pray for our nation. Pray that our nation would be a blessing to all nations. And as we come to the table, may I ask that we focus on the, uh, just for a second, on the 15th verse of Psalm 72. In the NLV it reads, long live the king. Or in the NIV, long may he live. You know, as a very young kid, I was always confused in, when I watched a movie or read a book and it said, the king is dead, long live the king seems a little bit contradictory. The king is dead. Long live the king. It's actually a very old saying, and it probably predates Psalm 72 by a couple thousand years. It announces the end of the old regime and the beginning of a new order, I, I suppose to express some sort of social and political continuity. And I promise we'd get back to the coronation hymn of Asher Banipal and how it differs from Psalm 72. It's true that people in the ancient Near East wanted their kings to defend justice and, and bring prosperity. But for the Mesopotamians and the Assyrians and the Babylonians, they could not conceive of a future king who would usher in or bring an ideal age. In fact, in Mesopotamian mythology, a, a man named Gilgamesh goes on an adventure 2,000 years before Ashurbanipal, and he's looking for the secret of eternal life, and he finally concludes with this line. Life which you look for, you will never find. For when the gods created man, they let death be his share, and life withheld in their own hands. In other words, there is no life beyond this one in Mesopotamia. There is no future hope of a, of a Messiah or a deliverer who is going to set all things right. Their ideas of kingship were short-term, not long-term. The very idea of a new earth and a new heaven, they were completely foreign and inconsistent with their worldview. And every time, just like Solomon, their kings failed them. Not so for us Christians. Again, verse 19 of Psalm 72 reads, Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. This is the promise of Isaiah 16 and Revelation 21. A new heaven, a new earth. So we Christians can say, long live the king. And we say it not because the previous king is dead. We say it because our king is alive now and forever. He, he died to deliver the needy, crush the oppressor, redeem the people from their failure. By dying for his subjects, he fulfills the promise of, seven, of, of Psalm 72 to protect the needy from death because he defeated the grave and he's risen and seated on the throne, king of the entire cosmos. That's a royal vision of Jesus. And so we can announce not the king is dead, but the king is alive. Long live the King. Amen. That's our proclamation here at the Christ table. The King is alive. Long live the King.
If you believe that, that the Lord is Savior of your life and King of the cosmos, then you are welcome to participate. If you don't believe that, then please don't partake. This is a meal for believers in the power of broken body and shed blood. And if you'd like to talk about it, please find me or one of the other elders after the meeting. We'd love to talk to you. That could be the most important conversation you have in eternity. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You can prepare your packets. We'll take them together after we pray. Father God, thank you for giving us a picture of our true and eternal king. In Psalm 72, with the revelator, we look forward to that blessed day when the kingdom of the world will become once and for all eternity, the kingdom of our Lord and Messiah, Jesus Christ. Take and eat. Jesus, what a king you are, what a God. You heal, you free, you deliver, you rescue, you rule, and you do it all in the perfect justice and righteousness of God. May your name endure forever. May every knee bow, and may all nations be blessed through you. Take and drink. Holy Spirit of God, will you guide and guard us this week? And every week, so long as we live, will you fill us to overflowing with abundant life? And would you please direct our steps and the way our living and eternal King would have us go? To the Father, in Christ's name and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we, we pray these things. Amen and amen. And if you'd stand with me, we're going to have a benediction. And perhaps not surprisingly, it's going to come from the doxology of Psalm 72. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, we are blessed to have such a king as this. Go forth in the name of your king and share his blessing. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.